Deuteronomy chapter 8, please. Deuteronomy chapter 8, if you go there. An opportunity comes to another generation. Father, I thank you with all my heart. God Almighty, I praise you and I bless you, Lord Jesus Christ. God, I thank you that you've given me this word. You placed it deep on my heart. I knew it came from you. I ask you for the grace to speak it, and you give us as a people the grace to hear it. Those that are gathered in this house and those that will be listening to it online in the days ahead, and whoever is listening today. Oh, Jesus, Son of God, give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is speaking to your church at this time. Help us not to put this away as just another sermon, another wonderful time in the house of God. But Lord Jesus Christ, speak deep into our hearts. Each of us, Lord, speak deeply to us. Let faith begin to arise. Give us a sense of vision and purpose and destiny in God. Give us hope and courage for the future. Help us to understand the divine moment in which we are living. God, I bless you. Give me the grace to speak this and the strength to speak it, the wisdom to know how to speak what is more than a message today. It's something from your heart. And Lord, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Deuteronomy chapter 8, an opportunity comes to another generation. Verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment, that means thy clothing, wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God chastened thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayst dig brass. And when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given thee. These are phenomenal words because 40 years earlier, a previous generation stood at the same borders of promise, and it required them to have faith to possess it. In Numbers chapter 13, we see that Moses sent in what I would call an advanced team to go in and look at the promises of God, to see whether or not what God had spoken about this land is actually true. And 10 of the 12 brought back a report that turned the hearts of the people away from what could only be obtained by faith. Now, in verse 26, it says, they went and they came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely it flows with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. In other words, we've seen it and it is exactly what God says it is. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. 
And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel. Now these spies, as it is, who went into the land, 10 of them brought back this evil report. There were two that Joshua and Caleb still remained men of faith. No matter what kind of an obstacle they saw in their hearts, they said that the promises of God supersede what we see with our natural eye. And yes, it is true, their walls are high and there are giants that occupy the place that's supposed to be ours. But they're bred for us, actually. Caleb said, Joshua said at one point, we can't go in. God will be faithful to give us what he's promised to give us. But the other 10 are a type of those who are given the first view of the promises of God. It's a type of the pastor, let me say it that way, who has the calling to search out this book and see whether or not it's true. And he or she has to see whether or not it's true by being a partaker of it. It's got to produce something in, a, in those of us who stand in pulpits in the nation. Otherwise, we come up with, you see, those 10 who came back with this evil report, they made a choice. They chose human intellect over and reasoning over faith. They must have considered the report accurate and reasoned. We went into the land and we're bringing back to you an accurate and a reasoned report. But God called this accurate and reasoned report evil. Hebrews 11.6 tells us without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever comes to God, that's including you and I, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Romans chapter 14, verse 23, the latter part of that verse, Paul makes an incredible statement, and he says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. It's, it's born of something other than God. It's deficient. It's not going to bring us into the promises that God's given to us. And Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Now, the reasoned response that overshadowed, we're not to abandon reason. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But reason has to lead us to faith, folks. Reason cannot lead us to seeing what we see with our natural eyes and making the assumption that God is not powerful enough to fulfill his word. That somehow the cities are too walled, the evil is too great, the power of darkness is too established, we are powerless to move against it, we're not going to be able to do this. And it's a type, in the sense, of the ministry that looked into the Word of God and came out with reasoned responses instead of faith, strategies of the human spirit. And it brings death and despair, and that's what it brought in their generation. It brought death and despair into the camp. Forty years of dying hopes, 40 years of decreasing optimism, 40 years of decay. Look at number 14, Numbers chapter 14, verse 28. Say to them, as surely as I live, says the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein except for or save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, your children, the next generation, which you said should be a prey. You said there was no power, in other words. You said that they were going to be swallowed. Them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. Now hear me on this. Today, you and I are the children of a season in history in this country were those who came before us in great but not total measure. Remember, it was only 10 out of 12 that brought this report. But those who came before us abandoned faith for human reasoning. We've come through church. I've been 36 years walking with God, and I came into the church, and I saw the curve. I was, came in right at the point where faith was turning to reasoning, and strategies were being developed. And the how-tos of how to live a godly life and the how-tos of how to do this and how to do that. All of these things were beginning to happen in the house of God. And I remember it so troubled me because when I was reading the scriptures, I was thinking, 
Does it not say that we are to obtain these things through faith? I went into my living room as a brand new Christian. And after nine years of hell, nine years of running out of rooms, nine years of suffering panic attacks, nine years of going through college with so much volume in my system, I felt like I was living underwater or in a bubble. Nine years of glasses of straight whiskey when a panic attack would come upon me. Nine years of living in hell. But I read in the Bible that if God be for us, who can be against us? And the devil came against me right after I came to Christ. And one of these panic attacks started to come into my heart again. If you've never experienced it, it's the closest thing to hell on earth you'll ever know in your lifetime. And I got up out of my bed and I didn't, get, I didn't know the whole Bible. I only knew a half a verse, that's all I could remember. Just the half of that verse that Paul spoke, if God be for us, who can be against us? I went down into my living room and I said these words, Satan, you can only kill me if God allows you to kill me. And if he does, if he does, I'm going to heaven. So I win either way. So you throw at me everything you've got. And I said these words, but I throw back at you what I now have in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I resist you. And at that moment, it's like a, a, a heat, a, a white hot heat hit my feet, went through my legs, through my torso, and literally out the top of my head. And I was set free in a moment of time from nine years of hell on earth. And God began to take me and stand me up before crowds of people all over the place to tell them that what God had done for me, God will do for you. I thank God with all my heart that at your early age, he taught me not to abandon faith for human reasoning. Yes, human reasoning is a good thing. And yes, it's not a wrong thing to determine that there are walls and there are giants and there is difficulty ahead of us for all of us, for the things that God has called us to be. But I am persuaded, I am convinced, as Paul was, that no height, no depth, no valley, no mountain, no power, no angel, no principality, nothing, nothing of this world or the world to come can separate me from the love of God. Nothing can separate me from the power of God. And so my power to reason leads me to faith. And that's where reasoning always should lead the people of God. But in this case, in the book of Deuteronomy, it led them to despair because they, it didn't move them to faith. It didn't move them to saying, listen, it is true, but God said this. It is true, but God said this. And God told us that this is our inheritance. Let's go in, let's take it. Let's fight. Yes, they had to fight for it. They were not just gonna lay there and the land wasn't gonna get up and move towards them. They had to get up and move towards the land. There's a certain forward motion involved in this. But God help us. In this nation, for 40 years, at least the 36 I've been part of the Christian church, I've been a witness to this, this move in the house of God where we've abandoned faith and for human reasoning. We've abandoned the reproach of Christ for social acceptability. We wanted a Christianity that was socially acceptable, that everybody would like, nobody would snicker at us and nobody would call us out of our minds Nobody would laugh at us, Every, it would be socially acceptable. So we abandoned the cross, the preaching of the cross, which is foolishness to those that are perishing. We abandoned the blood of Jesus Christ. We, we abandoned divine order. We abandoned the things of God. We abandoned the prayer meeting in the house of God for social acceptability. Well, we got social acceptability. We abandoned divine enablement for natural energy. All of these conferences I've attended over the years, all these places, all these strategies, it's all human energy. It goes nowhere. The strong can endure for a season, but even the strong fail. What a foolish people we have been as the church of Jesus Christ for the last 40 years in this nation. We abandon the seeking of God's leading in the ways of God for the gratification of self. And most of our theological focus is all about ourselves, how we become wonderful selves and new selves, glorious selves, how all of this stuff, you know, folks, most of what is preached in this country, you can't preach it anywhere else in the world. You can't preach it where people are suffering or going through difficulty. Think it, you know, you could just, you simply, you get rid of most of it by just taking all of these preachers to some of the places that I've had the privilege of traveling. I remember I did the first ever minister's conference in Uzbekistan where the bulk of those pastors had been jailed and tortured and many of them were going to return. Tell them that Christ has come to give them a better personality. 
and a finer car and shiny teeth and a great home. Tell them, I ate lunch with a, a man from China and he pulled up his sleeves and his, his pant legs to show me the scars where he'd been tortured in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tell him that Jesus has come to give him a finer life and a career. This theological abdication of faith brought weakness to the people of God and death to the nation. 20% of America is on food stamps now, food stamp assistance. Abortion has reached epidemic proportions. And it didn't have to. If the pulpits had been alive in this country, if pastors had been standing and preaching the word of God, if we'd been calling the people to repentance and faith and prayer and missions and everything else that goes with Christ, this didn't have to happen in this nation. Our families are being destroyed right before our eyes. The concept of family, the structure of family, God's order for family is, is crumbling right as I speak. Suicide is an epidemic. One, the, the statistics we were shown a few weeks ago, one in six young people in New York City have attempted in some form or another suicide in their lifetime. Now think about that. One in six of every kid you see on the street, every teenager you see walking on the streets, there's no safe place anymore. Violence is everywhere. There's no mall. There's no church. There's no school. There's nothing is safe anymore in this nation. These things are no longer up for debate. America is dying, and it has done so on our watch. We're dying morally. We're dying socially. We're dying politically. We're dying spiritually. And America has literally died and is dying on our watch. But folks, I want you to hear me in this because I've heard something from the Lord. I believe that we're being given a chance to experience something of the life that Jesus offers. It will not only be a blessing to us, but it will bring freedom to many others as well. Another generation. It's been 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years of death and hopelessness and destruction and decay. Somebody somewhere has to wake up in this country and realize with churches on every corner, our country is dying right before our eyes. Somebody has to wake up. It's time to leave the arena and get back to the house of God and begin to pray if we really care about our future. God help us to wake up before it's too late. God help us. How, how deep does the darkness have to go? How severe does the violence have to get? How broken does society have to become before finally somebody somewhere, for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ and for the souls of men, will finally raise, rise up and say, enough of this. I am going in and I'm going to possess what is mine. For the glory of God and for the souls of men, I'm going to live and be a testimony for God in my generation. But it requires something. It requires the same as it did for those in Deuteronomy chapter 8. All the commandments which I commend thee, verse 1, this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware to your fathers. It requires a willingness to obey God. If, if that's not there, then there is no, there's no going forward. Some, somewhere in your heart and in mine, and I'm not exempt from this any more than you are. But it requires a willingness to say, Lord, I don't fully get the path before me, but I know you have something for my life. And I know what you have for my life will bring honor to your name. I know it may not be easy. I may be scorned. I may be slandered. I may be misunderstood. I may be laughed at. It may even go deeper than that. It may mean difficulty for some of us. But, oh, God, I choose to obey you. If you speak to me, I'll follow you. Not in my strength, because my strength is not going to take me this journey. But I will at least stretch out my hands like Peter did. And I will allow you, God, to lead me. Where I can't go, where I don't want to go, I will allow you to take me there. Because I'm not willing that this nation should die in its sin. I'm not willing that even the enemies of God should die in their sin. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus Christ, to raise up a testimony again for the honor of your name. And do it, O oh God, in your church and among your people. Send an awakening, O oh Lord Jesus Christ. And even if it's only me, that's got to be the cry of your heart. Even if it's only me that wakes up spiritually and begins to lay hold of the throne of God one more time, then so be it. 
Even if I'm the only one in my family, the only one in my workplace, even if I'm the only one in, in my job, in my community, oh God, you've proven all throughout history that it only takes one person to make a difference in a family, in a community, in a workplace, in a nation. Throughout history, you've proven it. Otherwise, we've studied all this for nothing. We've studied about Esther and Gideon and Moses. You've showed us, Lord, that you can take young, you can take old, you can take educated, you can take uneducated, you can take anybody that just says, here am I, oh God, use me for your glory. And Lord, you can raise up a testimony one more time. How many times, how many testimonies do we need before somehow, some way, there'll be something to get into our hearts that says, God, I will obey you if you give me the strength. I'll not make a boast like Peter did for my natural strength can't take me there. But oh God, if you will strengthen me, I will obey you. I will not drop back. I will lay hold of the fullness of everything that you have for my life. I will enter into your work, which is the saving of the lost and the glorifying of the name of God on the earth. Oh God, help me, help me to obey you. Verse two, he says, thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether you would keep his commandments or no. You will remember how faithful God has been, how faithful all these years. I look back over my life, folks, it's not all been easy. I've lost two homes. I've had a son severely burnt in a fire. There have been times where I didn't know if I could go another day. But God has been faithful, and I'm still here, and I'm still standing, and the, the testimony is the same for you. The people stood at the border, and they, they forgot how faithful God had been. Everyone in the choir, think about this. I know you've all had hard times, but you're here. You're still here. You're still standing, still fed, still clothed. God has been faithful, and we, we must... We must remember how faithful God has been or we will lose our courage for the future and for where he's leading us. Verse three says, he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. He caused difficult times. He was training us for a moment. He trained you, he trained me. He humbled us. He didn't allow us to rise up in arrogance and pride. He didn't allow us to boast of ourselves. This whole season he was training another generation. And now some people here now, your suffering is gonna make sense this morning as you hear these words. Oh God, now I understand why it's been so difficult. Why I have hungered, but you have sustained me. The only reason I'm still sitting in the seat that I'm in today is because your words have kept me. I don't know how I paid my bills, but I did. I don't know how my cupboard got full, but it did. I don't know how I got through the valley of the shadow of death, but I did. You led me through seasons in my life when I didn't know how I was gonna go forward, but oh God, you miraculously just gave me a word. And it was on the strength of that word I could go another day. And when I got to the end of that day, it was on the strength of, of another word that I could go another day. You caused me to know that man does not live by his own resource and his own strength, but I live by every word that has come out of the mouth of God. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. It all makes sense. I see it now. I understand the troubles, the trials. I understand the difficulties of God. I understand the groanings, Lord. I understand these times. All these days you were just working faith into my heart. Oh, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, how faithful you are. I am still here, I've lived by the word of God. Hallelujah. 
Thy raiment, verse 4, he says, wax not old. Neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. In other words, he says, in Christ, for you and I, our covering is not faded. We are clean, declared so by a holy God. We are sons and daughters of a holy God in spite of our struggles and failures and trials and difficulties and questions. And that covering is not faded. And neither has our strength to go forward diminished. That's what he means by your foot didn't swell, your, wa- your raiment didn't wax old. Now that's a type of you and I today. Oh, thank God. Thank God. It has been difficult over the years for many of us. But oh, thank God. The covering is still there. The smile of God is still upon us. He still looks at you and I and calls us son and daughter. Jesus Christ is still boasting about us to his father. He's at the right hand of God. He's still speaking your name. And God is still receiving you. The covering has not grown dim over the years. Verse 5, he says, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God chastened thee. God chastens us, the scripture says, for our good. You see, he was preparing this. You see... This is now, these words are now being spoken to a generation, another generation going in. These were the children of those who chose to live by human reasoning and didn't go into the promised place in God. But this is another generation. And they've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And they begin to realize that God had to chasten them because the scripture says everyone that he loves, he chastens. That we could be a partaker of his holiness. He chastened us for our good. I remember after coming to New York City, I got, I mean, I've been through a lot over the years, and I remember coming here, and we ended up getting a parsonage that was mold-infested. We didn't even know such a thing existed back then. And for a period of about seven years, I was very, very sick. And to the point where when it was finally discovered in our home, one of the foremost medical experts in Albany, told me, he said, you were weeks, months, if not just weeks from death. He said, whoever got you out of the house, you owe him your life. And it was Pastor David that the Holy Spirit told him there was something wrong with the house to get somebody in there to do a a testing of it. They walked into the house. They did an air quality sample. They, They literally condemned the house right on the spot. And everybody who walked into the house I had lived in for seven years had to wear a biohazard suit to go into the house. Amazing. We'd lived there and the Lord, I remember walking down the street and I was so short of breath that I would stagger. But the, and I would, in my heart, I said, God, is this really necessary? As if we don't have enough to do. We, we were going through difficult times in the church and there was five services a week. They were all preaching services. Sometimes I had to do three, other weeks two. We were counseling. We were doing everything, which was nonstop. And on top of that, sickness came. And the Lord told me, you have to trust me with this. I'm doing this for a reason. I'm going to make you dependent on me so that you will not be able to do the things that you want to do. You will will need to walk in my strength because if you walk outside of my strength, yours will not last you for very long. And that has kept me these years. I can't accept every invitation that comes in. Sometimes I've wanted to, but I know from experience, if I go somewhere and God didn't call me, I come back, it takes three weeks to recover from it. But if the Holy Spirit has called me, I come back stronger than when I went out. There's a huge difference. And so to this day, I don't want to do anything that God's not orchestrating. I I really don't care how wonderful the idea is. If it's not coming from the Spirit of God, it's worthless, and I want nothing to do with it. Verse 6, you also keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee unto a good land, a land of brooks and water, of fountains and of depths that spring out of valleys and hills. In other words, God was saying to these people and to you and I today, I'm bringing you to a place of spiritual strength that holds firm when we're up and holds firm when we're down. It doesn't diminish. You can, get, you can get over the mountains and not be exalted in pride and not get caught up in yourself and you go through the valleys and not get overwhelmed by despair and difficulty. There'll be a strong confidence come into your heart. As Paul said, 
I am persuaded that God is able to keep that which I've entrusted to him against that day. How did Paul get to that place in his life? You read it in Corinthians. I've been three days beaten to death almost. I've been shipwrecked. I've been betrayed. I've been hungry. I've been cold. I've been in fastings. I've been in nakedness. I've been turned on. I've been left alone. I've been imprisoned. I've been in chains. I've been shamed. But all these things, he had learned that he was more than a conqueror through Christ who promised to keep him and strengthen him. It is a land of spiritual strength. We're going to go through difficult days, my friend. But God says, I'm willing to give you a strength that will hold firm when you have food in the cupboard and when you don't. When you see your way through tomorrow and when you don't see your way through tomorrow. Versailles, he said, it's a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, oil, olive, and honey. In other words, it's a place in Christ of anointing, a place of provision, and a place of vision. A land, verse 9, where thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou may dig brass. In other words, God says, I'm taking you to a place of promise, that's new and fresh every morning. Something that could only come from God. Morning by morning, I love that song, New Mercies I See. That's been my whole life, folks. I feel like David sometimes, oh God, if you marked iniquities, who could stand? If, if you took account of every thought we think that we shouldn't, if you took account of every word we speak that we shouldn't, we'd all be doomed. There'd be no chance for any of us. But morning by morning, I see new mercy. Not only forgiveness, but the promise, I'm going to, you let me take you and I'll change you. I'll make you into the person that you are called to be to bring glory to my name on the earth. I'll put in your heart what needs to be there. I'll change what needs to be changed. I'll take out what you can't change. You can't change your spots like a leopard can according to the scriptures, but I can change you and I will change you. By the words that I speak to you and by the spirit of God within us, God promises you'll bring that change. The scripture goes on to say, verse 9, it says, it says, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou may dig brass. It's a land where labor increases strength and trials increase the treasure of Christ. Where we're not pushed back by opposition. We have a confidence in the promises of God. We have something within us that says, I am not going to be left here. I'm not going to make the mistake of the previous generation. I'm not going to stand in a place of human reasoning that will paralyze me and stop me from inheriting what is mine in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to stay there. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what any lying voices. I don't care what any devil of hell tries to tell me. I don't care what any old school teachers told me or, or, or people that were in, in charge of my life. I don't really care. All I care about is what God says. I care about his promises. He says from image to image and glory to glory, he says I will increase in strength. He promises to make me into what I could never be, take me where I could never go and give me what I could never possess. And he says he will do it for the glory of his name that my life might be a testimony, a witness in all the earth of the reality that there is a God who did die for humanity, rose from the dead on the third day and now sits at the right hand of all authority and power and it will not be relegated to an argument I was with Leonard Ravenhill one time for a few days and he said to me, Pastor, he said, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. Let the theologians argue. Let them argue. I have an experience with God that speaks for itself. Let the anointing answer all of the critics. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to the name of Jesus. Every once in a while throughout history, there's somebody somewhere that lays hold of this truth. Not necessarily the strongest or the most wise. Not necessarily somebody of noble or royal birth. Not necessarily somebody with a dozen certificates on the wall. No, just an ordinary person of faith that says, oh God, here I am. And if you can take my little lunch and multiply it and feed thousands, I invite you to do it, oh God. I invite you to do in my life what only God can do. 
And yes, I've got giants in my life. I've got giants of fear and I've got giants of despair and I've got giants of depression and I've got giants of lying voices that have spoken over my life. I've got giants of regret over how I've lived my life up to this point. Oh, I've got all these giants walled up to heaven and they're much stronger than I am. But oh God, they're not stronger than you are. And so Lord, let's go in. Let's go in to the promise of God in Jesus Christ. Let's go in. Lord, I'm going to get what is mine. And I don't care who stands in the way. I don't care how big they are. I don't care how tall their walls are. I'm going in and I'm getting what is mine. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I tell you one thing, God, the only promise I can make is when I get there and when I've learned that, that even my hard times produce strength and every hill I've got to climb is going to deepen the treasure of Christ in my life, Oh God, you will plant a song within me. And I'll tell you one thing, I will not glorify myself. I will not glorify some church. I will not glorify some preacher. I will not glorify my own human effort, but I will sing of you, oh God. I will give glory to you. You are the only one that could have taken me through the flood and the fire and the difficulty. You're the only one that brings strength out of weakness and joy out of sorrow, and beauty out of ashes. You're the only one that can do this, oh God. So Lord Jesus Christ, I'll have a song, and my song will be of you. When you've eaten, verse 10, when you're full, then you will bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. You will bless him, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Praise and bless his holy name. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God and many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. All that God requires of us is a willingness to get up and go in. It's no deeper than that. You gotta read this book, folks. You gotta know what is yours. You gotta read it, you gotta understand it. You gotta get it in you and say, this is mine. These are words from the mouth of God. God's words have the power to create a universe. God's words can raise people from the dead. God's words can open blind eyes. God's words can heal disease. God's words can set free the captive. These are God's words. These are not just words of men who decided to write down something fancy about God. Men of old were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. And this is a book written by the hand of God. These are God's words. And you have to understand God's words have the power to create life. The gospel we preach is about God raising men from the dead. And all that is required of us is when we see it, we get up and go in. It's a willingness to cross that boundary that leads to faith and victory and say, I'm going to possess all that God says in Christ is mine. We're another generation. I want you to hear this because I know God gave this to me. We are another generation. The nation has come to a screeching halt. The only hope for this country is the church of Jesus Christ. There's no other hope now. We are spiritually, politically, socially, and morally dead. Jesus Christ is still alive and he has a people. And God is extending an invitation to me and to you to get up, cross the boundary of fear and unbelief and say, I'm going to possess all that is mine. And I'm going to walk in the path that God lays out for my feet. I'm not going to try to use Jesus for my agenda anymore. I'm going to let Jesus take my life and I'm going to let God use my life for his glory. 
He will take you on a path that you never believed you'd go on, give you giftings and strength that you never, ever thought were possible. Some of you will be preachers. All of you will have a testimony. The giftings of God will come into your heart. And these are supernatural abilities God gives of his Holy Spirit. Freedom will become your song. Strength to go through trial and difficulty. The society is very soon going to be looking for hope. There is no other hope that is eternal but the hope offered through Jesus Christ. And so my altar call this morning is very, very simple. Lord, I'm getting up and I'm going in. So whatever that means for me. Many, many years ago, I was in a church service and I got up out of my seat. I was sitting in, close to the back and I came and I knelt at an altar. And I remember the words I said, Lord, I, I have hardly anything to give you. But I give to you what I have and I believe that you're going to give to me what you have. All I ask is that you take my life and somehow use it for your glory. I'm not going to stay at this border of human reasoning any longer. I'm going to let the mind that you've given me lead me to the reasoning of faith that says, with God, all things are possible. And folks, what a journey this has been. From running out of a room and not able to stay there if people focus their attention on me, to, never, to not being able to speak publicly it was a, a horrifying thought, actually, to me personally. I have lived to see thousands of people come to Christ, traveled much of the world. It's been an amazing journey. But I believe that the Lord sent me to New York City to tell you that this journey is not unique to just a few individuals. It's to whosoever will. There has to be a willingness to, to be led of God. Now, I'm not going to say that it, it came without a battle. Some of the times that he has led me, it's taken weeks, if not months, for me to yield because of my own fears and stubbornness, my own desires. But as much as I know, I've always yielded. And as I have, it's been through one door after another into the miraculous of God. This is the testimony that this country needs now. Your family needs it. Your neighborhood needs it. It's a supernaturally empowered life by the Spirit of God. Please, go in. Let's not die in the wilderness. We must go in now. We must. Father, I thank you that, Lord, you will give everyone here the courage and those that are listening online, Lord, the courage to go in and possess everything you have for us, the calling on each of our lives, the giftings that will come with it, the ability, Lord, to be a living witness. Lord, this is a sovereign moment. It's an invitation to another generation. Forgive us, Lord, for what we've done to this nation. For the decay of a country, always, the blame of it is always laid at the pulpits of the nation. There's no one else to blame. Pulpits were inhabited by people who took an evil report of the promises of God back to the people. God, forgive us for what we've done. Grant us the privilege of walking in the supernatural life of Christ one more time. Bring a testimony, Lord, to your name and put a song within us that nobody can, nobody can cause it to be quiet any longer. Father, I thank you for this with all my heart. In Jesus' name. I'm going to worship for a few moments. And as we do, if the Lord's speaking to your heart and you want to respond and say, I, I hear what God is saying and I'm, I'm going in. I'm going to get what is mine. I'm going to get all of the life of Christ that God has for me. 
If that's in your heart, as we stand, you can make your way to the front of this auditorium or in the annex between the screens. In the North Jersey campus, the same thing between the screens. And those that are at home, just perhaps you just go to your knees in your living room. Let's stand together, please, and just come. We're going to worship for five or ten minutes. Thank you, Almighty God, for your mercy, Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. That you would take us in our weakness, Lord, and our frailty, with all of our confusion and our questions, and call us your own, and determine to glorify your name through us, Lord. We don't have any skills or talents, Lord, that could advance your kingdom. We don't have a plan that could honor your name, Lord. But God, we come back to your plan and we just yield to you, Lord. And just give you our bodies and our future and our all and just say, glorify your name. Oh God, thank you for this, Lord. You are so, so willing. So willing, Lord, because you love us, Lord. You're so willing to take us in. That's all you've ever wanted since Adam was lost, oh God is to have a people to take back into your presence again, to hug and hold and love and walk with. Oh, Jesus, thank you for loving us, Lord. God, help us now. Ordain us as you did the 120 in the upper room. There was no committee that gave them their license to preach. You gave it to them. With cloven tongues of fire and supernatural ability on each of them. I ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, that we would have the privilege of finishing the way the church started. God, you would come upon us with your Holy Spirit, oh God, and you would fill us from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet with your Holy Spirit, oh God, and make your promises so real to us. Help us, Lord God. Oh, Jesus, thank you that that upper room was not filled with strategists. It was filled with weak people who let you be God. We choose to let you be God. That's the only choice we can make in life. We choose, Lord, to let you be God. We choose to let you take us into places we can't go in our own strength. And we choose to let you make us into that which you've called us to be. We choose to not receive the report of all the cities and barriers that are raised against us. But Lord, we receive your report. God, let this be an ordination service today where men and women are set apart supernaturally by the Spirit of God to do a work that only God could do. And Lord, when you do bring us in, let the song we sing be of you, Lord God Almighty, let it be of you. Let every name disappear and let your name appear. Oh God, I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, for hearing our cry today. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us in, Lord, to that inheritance. There is no other plan now for our future. There is no other plan for this nation but a church, a true church, a living church. God bless your house all over this city. I don't care what name is on the door. Let the blood of Jesus be inside and the Spirit of God be upon the people. Lord, raise up preachers of the gospel in this city all over the place, Lord, and let it be so quickly done and so powerfully done that nobody, nobody could take credit for it. Only the name Jesus would be lifted up. It's the cry of my heart, Lord. God, help us to pray when we go out worldwide. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ. You have ordained this meeting. Help us to pray with faith and to believe for others, Lord. God, I thank you for this, Lord. I thank you, Father. I pray that each heart here be open and you take us in like a mighty army into this darkened generation. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. For us, actually, 
Caleb said, Joshua said at one point, we, we can go in. God will be faithful to give us what he's promised to give us. But the other 10 are a type of those who are given the first view of the promises of God. It's a type of the pastor, let me say it that way, who has the calling to search out this book and see whether or not it's true. And he or she has to see whether or not it's true by being a partaker of it. It's got to produce something in, a, in those of us who stand in pulpits in the nation. Otherwise, we come up with, you see, those 10 who came back with this evil report, they made a choice. They chose human intellect over and reasoning over faith. They must have considered the report accurate and reasoned. We went into the land and we're bringing back to you an accurate and a reasoned report. But God called this accurate and reasoned report evil. Hebrews 11.6 tells us without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever comes to God, that's including you and I, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Romans chapter 14, verse 23, the latter part of that verse, Paul makes an incredible statement. Fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayst dig brass. And when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given thee. These are phenomenal words because 40 years earlier, a previous generation stood at the same borders of promise and it required them to have faith to possess it. In Numbers chapter 13, we see that Moses sent in what I would call an advanced team to go in and look at the promises of God to see whether or not what God had spoken about this land is actually true. And 10 of the 12 brought back a report that turned the hearts of the people away from what could only be obtained by faith. Now, in verse 26, it says, They went and they came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them to know how to speak what is more than a message today. It's something from your heart. And Lord, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Deuteronomy chapter 8, an opportunity comes to another generation. Verse 1, all the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment, that means thy clothing, wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God chastened thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. In other words, we've seen it, and it is exactly what God says it is. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwelt by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. 
And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel. Now these spies, as it is, who went into the land, 10 of them brought back this evil report. There were two that Joshua and Caleb still remained men of faith. No matter what kind of an obstacle they saw in their hearts, they said that the promises of God supersede what we see with our natural eye. And yes, it is true, their walls are high and there are giants that occupy the place that's supposed to be ours. But their brethren, Deuteronomy chapter 8, please. Deuteronomy chapter 8, if you go there. An opportunity comes to another generation. Father, I thank you with all my heart. God Almighty, I praise you and I bless you, Lord Jesus Christ. God, I thank you that you've given me this word. You placed it deep on my heart. I knew it came from you. I ask you for the grace to speak it, and you give us as a people the grace to hear it. Those that are gathered in this house and those that will be listening to it online in the days ahead, and whoever is listening today. Oh, Jesus, Son of God, give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is speaking to your church at this time. Help us not to put this away as just another sermon, another wonderful time in the house of God. But Lord Jesus Christ, speak deep into our hearts. Each of us, Lord, speak deeply to us. Let faith begin to arise. Give us a sense of vision and purpose and destiny in God. Give us hope and courage for the future. Help us to understand the divine moment in which we are living. God, I bless you. Give me the grace to speak this and the strength to speak it. The wisdom.